Hello everyone, it's Ilbe from Ferlataro. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to have a look at my favorite darker decks. So many of you may wonder why this choice for these decks today. And it's very simple because in the Southern Hemisphere where I'm located, I'm located in Australia, we're actually celebrating Samhain these days, or at least at the moment in which I'm filming this video. And I know that the majority of my viewers are from the Northern Hemisphere and so most of you guys right now will be going outside and taking advantage of the longer days and light and the bees and the flowers and you just have celebrated Beltane, which is obviously all about this power of creation and the enthusiasm that will drive you throughout summer. However, for us in the Southern Hemisphere, we're actually going through the opposite of that. And, and so I thought to myself, what decks am I most attracted to these days? And there's no two ways around that. I do have a passion for dark decks. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you will know this. And so today I'm just going to dedicate this video to all of my favorite darker decks. Now I have the, posted this video um, last year as well, more or less around this period of time. And uh, I don't want to show the same decks. so. Uh, we all know, for example, that I have the Deviant Moon Tarot, which is one of my favorite decks, and that definitely quali qualifies as one of my favorite darker decks. But I wanted to show you something different. So sit back and relax and perhaps have a drink. Uh, it's probably going to be a long video. So the first two decks I want to talk about are the Tarot of Vampires. And I want to show you this deck um, paired up with the Victoria Francis Oracle Cards. Now this is an older edition of this deck by Los Carabel. And I think, I may be wrong, but I think that it now it's called Victoria Francis Gothic Oracle. Um, in any case, it's this one here that has this image on the, on the box. And I want to show you these two together because they actually pair up really well, even though it's not the same author. So obviously we're looking at the Tarot of Vampires by Ian Daniels, whereas the Victoria Francis Oracle is, well, you guessed it, by Victoria Francis. But I really feel that the vibes are very, very similar. And I recently talked about the um, how incredibly knowledgeable and uh, detail the book, the companion book that comes with the Tarot of Vampires is. So the Phantasmagoria, um, it is very detailed. So I remember saying when talking about this deck in the other video, that this deck, um, let's say the companion uh, book alone is worth the price of this deck. Even if you're not into vampire, if you don't vibe with the art style, uh, which is probably also my case, so this would not have been my uh, choice, my pick, had it been not for the companion book. But this is such an amazing book that I highly recommend it. Let's have a look though at the cards. So this is a deck that, as you can guess, obviously is based on vampires, but it's such an amazing deck. And I really, really love to pair it up with the Victoria Francis, I think, you know, gothic oracle, or just oracle. And I'm just going to show you how much of a conversation these two actually have when you pair them up together. So as you can imagine, the light is not perfect today, but because, as I said, we are going through the darker uh, part of the year. So obviously, you know, sometimes it's overcast, more often than not, it's um, cloudy. And so it is what it is. Let's see if it gets too dark, then I'm gonna try and use some artificial light. But for the time being, I'm just gonna try and stick with natural light. Now, as you can see, the Victoria Francis Oracle doesn't have keywords, which is one of the things that generally speaking would be a deal breaker for me, especially when it comes to an Oracle, or well, almost exclusively, I would say, when it comes to an Oracle deck. And that depends on the reason that I really want to see whether I resonate or not with the keywords chosen by the creator of the deck. But I have to say, um, when I got this deck, I really felt like, like it was talking to me. There is still is so much communication going on out of the images in the card. And even though I will have to apply some kind of intuition in order to be able to do a reading, I found it not difficult at all. 
there's always this intensity in the expressions, for example, of the characters, which in many cases, and that's one of the main reasons why I like to pair with the Tower of Vampires, is actually mirrored in the characters on the tarot cards as well. Something else that really pair up well and makes it a um, successful um, pairing is the fact that the art style is not that much different. The characters always look, um, they take with themselves some sense of decadence, which is more often than not associated with the old um, theme of the vampires. But there's also this sense of being in between life and death, which I really, really like. And that's also why I actually really love taking out this deck out of my shelves when it's this time of the year. Not just necessarily just on Samhain, but also during the even darker months, which are going to wait for us just around the corner in Australia. So I live in Sydney, which is in the southern part of Australia. And obviously being in May now, we see less light during the day. This will become even more dark um, in June and July. And then, you know, slowly, slowly, we're gonna get back to more light and warmer temperatures when it comes to August. But still, we have at least three months of darkness uh, ahead of us. And I find that there's a lot of us, especially on Instagram, for example, we have a really big community in Australia of tarot collectors and tarot readers. And I see that everyone is slowly um, being drawn to these decks rather than, you know, the more uh, brighter colors and brighter themes of uh, spring decks, for example, that I see more often than not in the uh, um, accounts of people from the Northern Hemisphere. Now, I absolutely love this card because this is Venice. I don't know if you can tell, but this is the Rialto Bridge and this is a gondola. And this is obviously one of the masks. I really, really like this card because it talks about that kind of eerie, melancholic atmosphere that you can find in Venice, especially in, let's say, January and February, but also in November. And there's also a little bit of fog that is is just floating above the canals and it just makes Venice the beautiful city that it is. It's one of my favorite places on earth. There is the sense of abandonment as well that comes out of these cards, both from the Oracle and the Tarot. And one other thing that I really like to do is focus on directionality. So in some cases, you will see that in both decks, there's characters that are looking directly at us by breaking the fourth wall. Sometimes instead, they're just looking outside of the frame. And when they're doing so, it's very interesting to notice, for example, where if we drew a line, where would the line go? And what does that tell us about the cards? So really, really beautiful, these two together. So deliciously dark. I always have a great time pairing up these two together. So as I said, these are the Tarot of Vampires and this is the Victoria Francis Oracle or Gothic Oracle. And another two decks that I wanted to show you today with very similar vibes are both from Los Carabeo. One is called the Dark Angels Tarot and the other one is the Dark Fairy Tale Tarot. I really love, especially the Dark Fairy Tale Tarot, but I have to say, I wasn't a fan of the image on the box. And so because I wasn't actually actively seeking for work throws on YouTube, for example, or Instagram of this deck, I never actually knew how beautiful the cards were. Once I finally decided to check it out, I found out that this is probably and quickly becoming one of my favorite decks for this time of the year. Another thing that I'm not entirely a fan of, generally speaking, are these kind of borders. However, I find that in this deck in particular, they actually work really well. And I'm going to show you these two decks together because I think that they actually pair up quite nicely probably also because of the borders. So if you don't know the story or the concept behind these two decks, the Dark Fairy Tale Tarot, which is the one on the right, is actually based on what the name suggests, so dark fairy tales. 
The one on the left instead, which is called the Dark Angels, is based on the concept and the story of the, basically the apocalypse. So after the end of the world, there's only Dark Angels that chose to remain behind. And I really like this sense of post-apocalyptic kind of world. I think it's one of the major vibes that we have these days because of you know, obviously having more darker days ahead is because we feel attracted to these kind of drawings, this kind of color palette, as you can imagine, obviously, rather on the dark side. But as you can see, um, these two are almost mirroring each other because the borders are not that dissimilar. Even the font used for the numbers um, are very similar. There's this really strong darkness that comes across. There's also a sense of defiance in both of these decks. And the sense of defiance comes from the ability to survive also when the sun goes down. So when we are surrounded by darkness, it's actually more difficult because we tend to turn towards ourselves, our core selves, and protect ourselves from the outside. And these two decks can actually really help you doing that. Now, there is this concept or this idea, I love this card, by the way, the Five of Pentacles. Um, so you can see the traditional elements in this card, but at the same time, you can also see that there's that sense of darkness. And ironically, because of the Five of Pentacles, generally speaking, being a rather dark card in the your normal RWS, this is actually breaking the rose a little bit because we actually see this light coming from uh, the sky which is kind of suggesting a sort of, sort of a silver lining to that sense of being um, excluded or being left out in the cold. So as I was saying there is this sense of survival we're surviving the lack of light the lack of sun the lack of, of life as well but we also want to turn towards ourselves, protect ourselves from whatever it is that is outside of us. And these two do an excellent job, both by themselves, you know, when you use them. Um, you can also pair them, both of them pair up really, really well with the Victoria Fantas Oracle. But I find that in this case, we can use these two tarot decks together as well. And there is also that beautiful sense of directionality that we have sometimes. As you can see, not all characters are facing forward. Sometimes they're looking outside of the frame, which, you know, it will bring me to, for example, to draw lines of br like bridges, for example, between the cards. And it's amazing how these two look alike. And I can assure you, it's not the same authors because if I'm not wrong, the Dark Angel is by Luca Russo, um, where the um, Dark Fairy Tales is by Raffaella De Angeli. So it's two different authors, two different creators. And yet we can feel how similar these two are. And that contributes to the fact that they pair up so well together. Now, this is obviously um, different from what you're uh, used to see, you know, in uh, YouTube, on YouTube these days, because as I said, um, most of YouTubers are in the Northern Hemisphere. And so obviously these days it will be all about Beltane. But, you know, this is an ode to my fellow YouTubers and tarot aficionados and collectors and readers from the Southern Hemisphere. Because I think that sometimes we get a bit neglected by the tarot community because um, the community in the South, even though it's very lively and very active, especially if you're part of any of the Facebook groups, for example, for sale uh, or trade of the decks, we still get neglected because sometimes, you know, because of the differences in obviously in climate and in the um, basically everything related to weather. And so this is just for us. This is a video that is going to be an ode to all of us that are actually craving some darker vibes in our practice these days. 
Now, at this point, I will usually show you the Murder of Crows tarot uh, published by Los Carabao and illustrated by Corrado Roy, who is one of my favorite illustrators. But because I've shown that deck so many times, I've actually shown, I've actually chosen to show you the Joker tarot right now. This is also published by Los Carabao, although it was a Kickstarter rather than a normal publication. And it's uh, also illustrated by Corrado Roy, as I was saying, one of my favorite illustrators definitely a dark uh, kind of deck. All of these decks, of the ones that I've seen at least so far, are really dark. And if you wonder what his um, normal work look like, it is very much similar. I do have a lot of uh, comics that have been illustrated by Corrado Roy and they share this very distinct kind of art style, which I really, really love. Now, this one was one of the three options of the Kickstarter, so I chose this one because uh, the Murder of Crows Tarot is in black and white, and there was an option to get the Joker Tarot in the black and white version as well, but I actually prefer to have some kind of colors in it. And when I was picking it out of the three, I believe the third one is a mini. Um, out of the three, I picked this one because I thought to myself, how am I going to react to the presence of color? So obviously when you're looking at the Kickstarter, you do have an idea about the cards, but they never really show all of the cards. So I was a little bit hesitant, if I have to be honest. But when I finally received the deck, I saw that the colors, even though they're there, I mean, we can see green here, obviously, but there's always a kind of a patina of darkness that is enveloping and embracing all of these colors. So it's never a bright red. It's always some kind of muddy kind of red and the same goes for all of the other colors as well. And the deck is so profoundly dark. You can see that pretty much from every single element in the cards. I mean, if you look at this Nine of Cups, which is supposed to be a positive card, but you see the expression on this Joker. It's just something really, really profound. And uh, I really love using this deck. Now, this is not a deck that I would use for reading for others, unless someone specifically asked me to use this deck for a reading. I generally speaking avoid using darker decks. So what you're seeing today is basically a collection um, that it's also due to my self-indulgence. So I am showing you the decks that I generally don't use in my practice for reading for clients, but I'm using for myself. And also, let me tell you, I wouldn't necessarily use this deck for a reading, an actual reading. What I do use these decks generally for is some kind of introspection and also in many cases for some, time, some kind of dark work, so in shadow work, because they are pretty much um, you know, useful when you look at them with this kind of lens. I have to say though, this is such an amazing deck that sometimes I just pull cards out of this deck just to have the possibility to look at them and see how they look together in a spread. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to do that. So without having too much of an intention for a reading, I'm just going to quickly shuffle the deck and then we're going to pull three cards just to show you how beautiful and deliciously dark this deck is. And let me tell you, I'm one, I'm one collector and one reader that really relies on the vibes of a deck. So in many cases, um, I actually pair up, let me just zoom out a bit. I actually pair up, or I try at least to pair up the right deck for the right reading. Um, so I have specific decks when it comes to career uh, questions, finance related questions. The Cross Magic Tower is fantastic for that, for example. Or, you know, when it's a reading, uh, when the person is going through a bit of a dark time, in that case, I go for a hug deck or something like that. But in this case, I just like this deck so much and the vibes that it gives so much that I just, you know, I wouldn't pair it for a dark reading because as a matter of fact, a dark reading sometimes needs a lighter deck. 
But if I may show you this, for example, so we got the Queen of Wands, the King of Cups, and the Ace of Swords. Now, having two core cards obviously doesn't show you much, and also because the Ace of Swords um, is minimally um, illustrated. So let me just pull another card, just hopefully for a minor or a major. Well, the Nine of Swords, of course. So you know what I mean? This has to be a dark, <laughs> really dark uh, kind of deck. So obviously when you pull a dark card out of a dark deck, you wouldn't expect anything less than this one. So what I mean with these, enjoying these kind of vibes is that when you look at this card, for example, this card has an incredible way to show the sense of anguish, of anxiety that wakes us up at 3 a.m. and the sense of actually, you know, screaming in the dark. This is referring to the kind of anxiety and worries that actually follow us every day of our lives and they stay dormant almost as if they were trying to catch up at the moment in which we're the least prepared for them. And so that's why I really love the way in which Corrado Roy has depicted this card because this is a fantastic way to illustrate that kind of sense of dread of the Nine of Swords. So as I said, these are the backs, by the way, uh, really beautiful as well. I don't necessarily see this deck around much. I think it was because even though there were thousands of backers of this particular Kickstarter, uh, perhaps, um, you know, it was delivered, I believe in December, maybe even January. And what happens is that People are kind of in the in the northern hemisphere, especially. You're kind of tired of the darker vibes, and you probably want to wait for Halloween to use this kind of deck. And for us in the southern hemisphere, you know, December and January are the most beautiful months because it's really sunny and it's really warm. So I haven't seen it much, but I really want to see whether there will be people using it. You know, picking up picking it out of the shelves when it comes for Halloween. Another tarot deck that I wanted to show you today is the Vampire Tarot. Let me just zoom back in. This is a um, US game. Is it a US game? Yes, it's an older US games deck. Um, unfortunately, it is out of print. Uh, and I say unfortunately because this is a really beautiful deck. It is, as you obviously uh, deduced, is a vampire based deck but it's slightly different from all of the other vampire decks that we've seen so far. It's by Natalie Hertz. And uh, you will remember, or you will know Natalie Hertz from, I think she's also the creator of the Fantastical Tarot, which is absolutely beautiful. And unfortunately, I've never been able to find a copy for less than $200. But if I, I'm still looking. So if anyone has a copy of the Fantastical Tarot, and uh, they want to part ways with it, and they're asking for less than 200 Australian dollars, please let me know, uh, because um, it's a deck that I would really love to have in my collection as well. So this is a rather peepish deck. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have, for example, for the three of ones, we have three ones. Although I have to say, these are not ones, these are pails used by Vlad, uh, the Count Vlad to impale their um, their enemies after uh, the war. So obviously it's got that sense of Dracula, um, the story of Dracula behind, and it's definitely very dark. There's always at least one element that reminds us of something in all of the cards, even though they are peep-like. And uh, I also really enjoy the chord cards because the expressions in these cards, in the characters depicted on the cards, is just really, really intense. This is the Death Cup, which is really beautiful. I think that Natalie Hertz has done a fantastic job in this deck because there is this sense of abandonment and, you know, like Dante's Inferno, leave any hope. Uh, you who enters or something like that. I'm paraphrasing from the Italian. This is the uh, card from the box, I believe. Yes, it is. And I really love that it's the Empress card. In many cases, you will have the High Priestess. And this is the Emperor card. So there is, I don't know if it's just me, but is anyone reminded of the 60s as well? 
So it's really, really nice to see these two cards, for example, together. It looks like, um, you know, these two were just going to um, a mu music festival, Woodstock, for example. And I really love that there is this kind of art style. This deck is not from the 70s, but it, I believe it is imprinted after the 70s. There's one thing that I don't really, let's say, it, to my brain is a bit painful when it comes to the height of the borders. When it's, for example, the Four of Swords, um, you will see, and so one of the minors, you will see uh, that it goes all the way to the top because obviously you see the title Four of Swords at the bottom. So the borders will be at the same level on the majors when it comes to the bottom, but it's not uh, when it comes to the top of the card. So if you want, for example, to trim the borders off of this deck, you need to be very careful because obviously there is a difference also in these uh, decorated borders there. So you will be chopping up, chopping off some of the decorations if, if you wanted to trim the borders off. But I have to say these are not very obtrusive and I have never felt like doing so. And it's also because in the last two, three years, I've actually decided not to do any kind of modification on a deck that is out of print because I just feel like sometimes I change my mind, especially when it comes to the borders. I like them, then I don't like them, then I wish I didn't take them off. Then I repurchase the deck with the borders, then I still don't like them and I chop them off again. So um, when it comes to mass market decks that are very affordable, I'm actually okay to do so. But when it comes to an out of print deck, it's just no point. Look at these two pentacles, that is so beautiful. <laughs> it's very dark though. So you will see why I've chosen this deck because it's really, really cool. And it's the, ta the Vampire Tarot by Natalie Hertz. Another deck that I wanted to show you today is this one that comes in this beautiful pouch with this eye. And uh, this is the Hayworth Tarot. And it's based on the Welcome to Night Vale podcast. Now I listened to, when I got this deck a few years ago, I felt like I really wanted to listen to the podcast because I wasn't able to make the connections between the images and the meaning of the cards. And so I listened to a few episodes and I have to say, it's one of the weirdest podcasts I've ever listened to. Really, really weird. And at the end of the day, even listening to maybe 50 or 60 episodes, I still couldn't necessarily understand the choice of the creator for these cards even when referring them back to the um, the podcast. And so uh, by Googling, I found something really odd. So by the way, this is this might be a triggering deck. Sorry about that, I should have said that at the beginning. There are some of these images that are actually quite powerful, quite intense, and they may be triggering for some. So as I was saying, I was Googling, um, you know, this deck. I love the deck card, it's blank. And I found that there is even a website that uh, has a, an open source file. So it's an Excel file that you can download onto your computer and you fill in what you think are the meanings related to the cards and then the, you re-upload it onto the website. And so thanks to that um, spreadsheet, I was actually able to finally make sense of some of these cards, even though I have to say uh, not all of them. But this is one of my darkest texts and I really, really love it. I think that it's very talkative, very communicative. It also taps a lot into your intuition. Many of these cards are so powerful that can, as I said before, be triggering. And I have to say that I had the only other deck that gives me the same type of vibes. A lot of, I heard a lot of people saying that they can't stand this strength card. I think it's extremely powerful. I do, however, understand why uh, it may be triggering. So the only other deck I was saying that gave me the same reaction and the same fascination, I mean, look at the Seven of Swords. Isn't it absolutely, I don't know, it's like an explosion. Um, if you look at this card, so let me just see if I can 
bring it up. So uh, we have the Seven of Swords, so we all know about the vibe of the Seven of Swords, find yourself in a situation in which you have to do something that is against your own ethics and morals, but you have to do it anyway out of necessity. There's always someone depicted looking back, you know, apparently stealing something, looking back over their shoulders, to see what they leave behind, to see if someone has found them out, to see if someone is following, following them. But look, I'm drawing your attention to the two swords I left behind. And these are the hands of this person. So you can tell because this person is moving away and they don't have their hands. And so obviously they left something behind and they left their hands behind. And that tells you how difficult it is when you find yourself in a seven of swords situation in which you have to do something that is against your own moral code. And yet you have to do it anyway, perhaps to save someone, perhaps to save yourself. And so the sacrifice is so intense and so powerful that is the equivalent of losing your hands and leaving them behind. I love that card so much. I don't love the Seven of Swords per se as a card. It's a very tricky card. It's a very difficult card to accept. And whenever it comes out in a reading, to be honest with you, I cringe because I know the way in which I have to read it. However, I do appreciate this deck because it gives me that additional layer of information that I can apply to reading that card. So this is an absolutely fantastic deck and it's the Hayworth Tarot. Another deck that I wanted to show you today is actually a rather famous deck, it's the, the one with the long title. So Madame Lydia Wilhelmina's Tarot of Monsters, the Macabre and Autumn Scenes by Bethelin Bajema. You know how much I love this deck. I've talked about this deck several times. It is one of my unicorn decks. I was very fortunate to be able to find a copy without spending thousands on it. When uh, Bethelyn actually reopened her shop, every now and then she reopens her shop and she makes this deck and other decks that are her creation available in her website. But it's generally speaking a very small window of time. And so if you follow her on Instagram, you she actually does give announcements on when she's going to reopen the shop. So if you want to grab a copy of this deck and don't want to spend two, three hundred dollars on it, I highly recommend you know, uh, following up with Bethelyn's uh, Instagram account. This deck is so powerful. It is incredibly beautiful. Also from a, an actually artistic point of view, this, this is curated. It's a collage, but it's using curated art. And then, you know, it, the choices for this collage are just absolutely fantastic. I love that there is this permanent sense of decay it's almost as if, you know, all of the characters that are human, they had, they have this, I don't know if you can see because it's very faint, but um, if you can see this, this looks like lines of breakage. So it looks almost as if these character, characters were made out of porcelain, but there is breakage and these are the lines that um, make them unique. And it feels almost as if it were the stage before the Kintsugi. So we haven't broken down yet, so, so we, we haven't been given the possibility to put ourselves back together thanks to the Kintsugi and look like new and look different and look like Phoenix. But on the other hand, we have the stage which, are, which is just before this kind of breaking down. And so there is the sense of decay and decadence. And I love that the Knight of Coins, for example, has got a pumpkin uh, for a head. So there is this collage that looks at all of this curated art, and then there is the uh, superposition of these skulls sometimes, or dead or death-related elements uh, in many of these cards, as you can see here. And I think that it's extremely successful, the way in which Bethelyn has achieved this sense of uh, communi communicating the darkness behind the cards 
is very impressive and I really, really love this deck. And by the way, this is a really beautiful cardstock, very battery feel to it. The cards um, shuffle like a charm. Um, it's a very uh, straightforward kind of reader. Although, as I was saying about other decks before, this is not necessarily a deck that I would use um, you know, for clients readings, unless, you know, exp expressly um, requested to use it. I do use it a lot on pairings. I use it a lot on, um, you know, for my personal readings or sometimes just to um, have a look at the cards because I don't, I don't use tarot exclusively for reading or for meditation or for personal growth or for journal prompting. I just want to look at the cards sometimes. So I would do some pairings with an oracle deck just to see how beautiful they are together. And if, you know, if pairing it with another deck will give me that more knowledge, that different perspective that I can actually use when doing a reading. So this is the, what I call the Madame Lydia Tarot. And another deck that I wanted to show you today is the Darkness of Light Tarot. Now this deck is very special because this is an edition that came with white borders. I got it second hand but it came in excellent conditions and I absolutely love this deck. Um, if you have this deck you most likely will have the one with the darker border or even black borders at the top and bottom and you probably have the linen edition. This is not linen. This is a bit cardboardy but I actually don't mind it because it, it actually shuffles really well and it also fans out like a charm. This is a very special distinct feeling to this deck I would say. So you will notice that the fact that the borders are top and bottom are actually white instead of black gives a whole different kind of vibe to the images themselves. They look actually brighter. Now I don't have the other edition so if I did I would be able to show you the difference between the two but I believe that um, someone did a comparison video, I can't remember who, I think it might be Cheryl from the Two of Witches Tarot uh, because I saw the white bordered one in her channel and ever since then I wanted to <laughs> set my, um, you know, uh, grab a copy for myself. It took me a while to find one but I finally did and I'm so very happy that I did because honestly even though this deck comes to me at during really the darker times I actually do prefer it with the white borders as I said before because it makes the colors look brighter. It also gives you a different kind of direction when you're looking at it. You have a different set of mind when you're looking at these cards uh, between the two different uh, editions. It is such a beautiful deck and honestly ever since I got this I didn't feel the need to reach out for another deck that is very, very similar to this one. It's the uh, Heaven and Earth Tarot published by Los Carabel. It is a mass market deck but it's very similar to this deck. The Darkness of Light is very similar to the Heaven and Earth Tarot and I have to say the Heaven and Earth Tarot um, has some really not, not so pleasing, let's say, uh, banners at the bottom with the titles and so I always contemplated the possibility to chop them off but then I would cut into the um, art style artwork and I don't really want to do so. And I have to say, if you're Italian, you will know what I mean. This is reminding me so much of Garibaldi, who was a hero in the, uh, um, an instrumental hero in the creation of the uh, actual sovereign state of Italy. Italy, uh, well, it wasn't a state until 1861, if you can believe it, because it was just divided in all uh, different smaller states. So this, together with others, was a historical figure. Uh, he also um, uh, was instrumental in the wars for um, independence in South America, and then he came, out, came back to Italy, and uh, he was a hero in the, um, in the 1900 as well. But now I have a couple of honorable mentions and the reason why I'm showing you this deck is because I felt like the first decks that I was showing you today were really dark 
and sometimes in the darkness you need a bit of light. So the decks I'm going to show you now have a little bit of a whimsical side to them or a humoristic side to them, which actually helps you seeing them under a different uh, light. And this one is the Shadowland Tarot by Monica Budirsky. And by the way, I can't wait for her Awakening Tarot to be released in Australia, which won't be for another three or four months, unfortunately. But I have seen it for a while on Instagram in other people's accounts, and it looks really, really interesting. This is the Shadowland. It's from a few years ago. It is still a darker deck, or what I would call a darker deck, because of the presence of these darker kind of characters. Uh, there's always a bit of a skull there. There's, uh, you know, there is a reminder of spiders and spider webs, and there's also the sense of decay that we associate with uh, the darker decks. However, at the same time, because of the very peculiar kind of art style, I mean, look at this Temperance card, obviously, we've got this uh, skeleton of a bat, uh, which is catching fire, and uh, with cowboy boots, because of course, why not? You would have cowboy, red cowboy boots. And this is pretty much a summing up all of the vibes and the feelings that I receive out of this deck. So there's that sense of whimsical, of weird, strange, and also funny that we can find in the cards. For example, the, I love the strength card because this is, this is, this is one person with two heads. Um, and I, it, it's, it just looks so weird that it actually puts a, a smile on my face. And the lover's card as well. And the chariot that is using two spiders. And these spiders remind me so much of one of the books by in, uh, in Harry Potter, in the Harry Potter series. And so as I was saying, these decks are really, really interesting. I love the fact that the fool has been renamed as the Seeker. And I love the fact that this person has actually been decapitated. And it looks like the head is at the person's feet. But there is a cat that is actually indicating where to go. So <laughs> there's so much, you know, that you can say about these cards by looking at them. This, ironically, is one of the decks that I actually love to use for reading for clients because it's not just a dark deck and as a matter of fact I believe that that whimsical vein to it gives me the possibility to read the card in a different way and so I actually really like using this one thing that I'm asking you if you're watching uh, this video and you made it so far let me know if you have this deck do you actually pair it with an oracle deck and if you do could you please let me know which one because out of my collection my entire collection I haven't yet found an oracle deck that pairs well with this deck and it doesn't matter it's not a problem it's absolutely not a deal breaker I still love this deck and I will still use it it's just that I thought that it would be nice to find an oracle deck that pairs well with this one and how come on I feel like saying this is actually cute and you know my relationship with spiders you know that I would never call a spider cute maybe the peacock spider because it's actually really kind of cute but this card I don't know it's got a feeling to it that even though it's the nine of swords and it's talking about anguish and we've seen it earlier I don't know on the one hand to me this is like really funny and whimsical and almost adorable I would say. So I love the way in which using these cards and reading these cards is making me feel because it's almost as if you know even in the darkest time you can still find a way to chuckle and to have a laugh and to feel better. And so this is the first deck of my honorable mentions and then I have to say the second one is the Dark Mansion Tarot. This is by Tarot Taker Studio. There's a few version of this deck. This uh, mine is the one with the blue backs, as you can see. I believe that uh, there is one with the brown backs. I'm not entirely sure. So this deck, I call it my Tim Burton's deck because the stick figures remind me so, so much of many of his movies. But this is a dark deck. This is definitely one of the darker decks that I've got in my collection. 
But at the same time, I feel like saying the same what I said about the uh, Shadowland Tarot because even these figures have actually that sense of whimsical, that sense of funny um, because they look so stylized and obviously no one has such a thin neck or arms, etc. So you're already in a kind of a, you, you look at the cards with the different, different lens already, understanding that you're not looking at something realistic. And so you're ready to receive whatever the message is. But at the same time, in the Two of Cups, for example, you see these two birds, which are absolutely adorable. And, you know, there, but there's also a, an apple, which reminds us of, you know, Eve's apple and Adam and Eve. And at the same time, you see that there's a worm in the apple. So obviously there's, there's this sense of um, whimsical uh, attitude. There's this reminder to still have a laugh, even though perhaps we're going through darker times. And let me tell you, there is a correlation between human beings' moods, for example, or mood swings and the weather. So we are more prone to be more reflective, less, um, less dynamic, when it's a darker day, for example, when it's overcast outside, when it's even raining, it's most of the time referring to the that kind of mood you have on the uh, in the four of cups. So you're just staying there, you're still, and you're almost as if you were waiting for the sun to come out. And this deck is reminding us that perhaps we need to just go out ourselves and do something about it and not just wait back and, um, you know, for a sun that may or may not come out. And so I really, really enjoy this deck. And as I said, I just wanted to show after all of the dark decks that I've been showing you today, I just wanted to close this video with one of my favorite star cards, which is this one, this one here. So, so absolutely beautiful. I love all of the elements about it. And, uh, but I love all of these cards in this deck. It's really, really amazing. So that was it for today. Thanks so much for staying with me today on the first video. More to come. Have a great day.